I do not intend to undertake a sermon, a lecture, certainly not an oration, but I would like for just a few minutes to bear my testimony to you people. I'd like to take the witness stand in defense of the proposition that the gospel of Jesus Christ has been restored to the earth in our day and that this is the church of Jesus Christ. Now I say I would like to take the witness stand. I'd like to be able, if I could, for in just a minute to give some reasons for the hope I have and for my allegiance to the church. Perhaps I can bring it to you most quickly by referring to an incident which happened in London, England in 1939 in September, just before the outbreak of the war. I had come to know rather intimately a very prominent English gentleman, a member of the House of Commons, a member of the cabinet, formerly one of the justices of the Supreme Court of Britain, the author of many of the books which we in Canada studied while we were preparing for law. And in my conversations with this man on various vexations of the soul, as he called them, we talked frequently of religion. Just before the outbreak of the war, he called me on the phone and asked if I would come to his office and discuss with him finally some phases of the gospel because he said, I've been intrigued by what you've told me. I think there's going to be a war. If there is, you will have to return to America and we may not meet again. The latter statement proved to be prophetic. I went to his office and he said this, in effect, I'm not only intrigued, but a bit troubled by some things you've told me. And I, I wonder if you would be so good as to prepare for me a brief on Mormonism. I may say to you students that brief is something that men like President Wilkinson prepare when they're going into a court with the intention of presenting their case and giving their reasons for their position on any given question. He said, will you prepare a brief on Mormonism and come and let me be the judge and you discuss Mormonism before me as you would discuss a legal problem? He said, first I'd like to say to you that you have said to me a time or two that you believe that Joseph Smith was a prophet. You have said to me that you think that Jesus of Nazareth and God the Father appeared to Joseph Smith. Now he said to me, that's fantastic. He said, the thing I'm troubled about is to think that a barrister and solicitor from Canada, a man trained in logic and evidence, could give himself over to such palpably absurd ideas. Now this man, brothers and sisters, this, this great judge is one of, the, one of the most intellectual men I ever met. I think he had the most incisive mind. His, my, his, his mind seemed to me to be almost like a steel trap. And when he said, what you tell me about Joseph Smith is fantastic, I was bold enough to suggest to him that we perhaps should prepare or go forward right then with our discussion. I said I'd like to present my brief right now. He had intimated that I'd probably take three days at least to prepare for it because he said I'm going to give you three hours in which to present it. When I told him I was ready at the moment, I suggested to him that we have what in Canadian and English law and to some extent in this country is called an examination for discovery. An examination for discovery is, briefly, the getting together of the opposing sides, the attorneys and the plaintiff and the defendant, and seeing if they can find some area of agreement and thus save the time of the court later on. I said perhaps we could have an examination for discovery here and see whether 
there is some area of agreement. And from there we can start to discuss my fantastic ideas. He agreed to that quite readily. And I said, of course, I am proceeding on the assumption that you are a Christian. Certainly, I assume you believe the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, to be the word of God. I do. You believe what's written in the book? Certainly, yes. You say that my statement that God spoke to a man in this age is fantastic and absurd. To me, it is. Do you believe that God ever did speak to anyone? Well, certainly, all through the Bible we have evidence of that. Did he speak to Adam? Yes. Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jacob, Joseph, and on through the prophets. I believe he spoke to every one of them. Do you believe that that kind of contact between God and man ceased at the meridian of time or when Jesus appeared? No, he said it reached its climax, its apex on that occasion. Do you believe that God spoke through Jesus? Yes. Was he the son of God? He was. Do you believe, sir, that, and I'm going to have to shorten this considerably because I said it took me three hours to tell it to him and I must tell it to you in less than 30 minutes. Do you believe, sir, that after Jesus was resurrected and after he ascended into heaven, and I assume you think he did ascend into heaven? I do. Do you believe that a certain lawyer, sometimes referred to as a tent maker, by the name of Saul of Tarsus, on his way to Damascus, contacted that very individual, namely Jesus of Nazareth, who had been crucified and had ascended into heaven. Do you believe that Saul saw light and heard a voice? I do. Whose voice was it? It was the voice of Jesus Christ, for he so introduced himself. Then, my lord, and that's the way we speak to justices in the British Empire, my lord, I am submitting to you in all seriousness that it is, has been standard procedure throughout all recorded time for God to talk to men. He says, I think I'll have to admit that, except that it stopped shortly after the first century of the Christian era. Why did it stop? I can't say. You think that God hasn't spoken since then? I'm sure he hasn't. There must be a reason. Can you give me a reason? I do not know. May I suggest a reason or several? Perhaps God does not speak to men anymore because he can't. He's lost the power. He said, of course, that would be blasphemous. Well, then, if you don't accept that, perhaps he doesn't speak to men anymore because he doesn't love us anymore. He's gone off and left us to find our own way in the dark. Well, he said, God loves all men of all ages and is no respecter of persons. Well then, if he could speak, if he loves us, then the only other possible answer as I see it is that we don't need him. We've made such rapid strides, we're so well educated, we have such great science, we don't need God anymore. And then he said, and his eyes were moist when he said it, Mr. Brown, there never was an age in the history of the world, there never was a people or a time when the voice of God was needed as is needed now. And then he said, can you tell me why he doesn't speak? And my answer was, my Lord, he does. He has spoken. He is now speaking, and all we need is the faith to hear him. And then we proceeded to, rather quickly, and I must not refer to very much of what we proceeded to do, but we proceeded to prepare what I have been pleased to call a profile of a prophet. And I wonder if you students would like to fill in 